is the 120th episode of Decoding Fox News, and I'm your host, Juliet Jeske. Each week, I watch and analyze this past week. It was 23 hours of Fox News, and then break it down. I watch all the Fox News you'd never want to. Let's get into it. A disastrous debate and the Fox News spin of doom. And that is one of the uh, subjects that people are talking about here, too, that they felt sorry for him. And also some of them said, how could a wife let her husband do that? It's Jill Biden. Jill Biden is hanging hanging on for dear life. I saw some of her videos last night, you know, post-debate meetings at a Waffle House. Um, She also did a fundraising uh, appeal. And then she did a fundraising video. So this is a big dilemma for the Obama, the Valerie Jared and the that team, Jill Biden is going to make it very difficult. And the, that's Jill the Biden question. last night, um, when they went to the Waffle House after the debate, when when Joe Biden you? clearly looked like he was ready for bed, she was out there cheering and saying, "You did great. You answered all the questions." And, and then Jill she Biden a- in that clip, when you say it was, you know, mm-hmm. we need Joe. She says to him, like he's a toddler, Joe, you answered all the questions. And what did Trump do? You got the memo. He just lied. But Uh, but there are a lot of Democrats who say it's time to swap that guy out. The big question is, will Jill let them swap him out? The White House, the campaign, and Jill Biden. The first lady have a lot of explaining to do. Yeah, they because do. Everybody Florida. knows that Joe Biden's been kind of a puppeteer for him for a good while now. And it's not really any surprise that, you know, she's trying to prop him up and make him look good. But I think America's smarter than that. Lynn, right? what's your biggest takeaway from last night? Um, my biggest takeaway is um, I believe that Jill has got to be some sort of evil to have that man up there exactly like he was. Um, it was really sad. It was it makes me angry. Yeah, I've had a lot of women tell me that this morning, that they are very upset at Jill. Well, I did because I felt sorry for him, and I felt sorry for him because his family put him in this position. They should be taking him out of there. If they love that man, they wouldn't put him in those positions. Do you agree with that? Think how tempting it must have been for him, or should have been for him, to say, I served a term, I defeated Donald Trump, Um, I'm going to go back to Delaware. Why do you think that didn't happen? It's her. Because that's the way. So that's a bit of a cadre of a bunch of folks on Fox who are blaming Joe, Jill Biden, the first lady, for the fact that her husband had a terrible performance at a debate. And some of those voices you might not be used to were uh, Tammy Bruce was one of them. Rachel Campos stuff. He started it. You hear Brit Hume. Then there's a couple people at a diner. They're just random people who go to a diner. Steve Ducey, and then at the very end, very quickly, she says, because of her, because of her. That's Kellyanne Conway. So all of these people blaming Jill Biden for Joe Biden's actions. And I, as someone who used to be married a long, long time ago, boy, does that drive me crazy. I hated that. I hated that when I was married. I hated that. I try never to do that to any other couple. It's just awful. Uh, I used to joke, a short tangent, I used to joke that I was the Yoko Ono of the clown world because my ex-husband was sort of like a big deal in the clowning universe. And when I married him, people were just like, oh, because I wasn't a clown. (laughs) I know this sounds like I'm making it up. It's all true. They were like, who's that woman? And then I'm funny. So they didn't like that. They didn't like somebody who was funny who didn't take all the classes. I was an actor which they didn't count as anything. But they anyway, that's a whole other thing. And I got blamed a few times for things I had absolutely no input on uh, because people wanted to come at my husband, but they came at me instead. So I hate that. Stop going at spouses for stuff like this. So this is going to be a weird one. Buckle up, guys. Here we go. So last week, about 51 million Americans tuned in to watch one of the strangest presidential debates in recent history. Joe Biden looked pale, sick, and confused, while Donald J. Trump told lie after lie while mugging like a Looney Tunes cartoon version of Benito Mussolini. The moderators politely sat back and didn't correct the most egregious falsehoods, such as Trump's declaration that babies are murdered after birth in Democratic-led states. I documented 53 false or misleading statements made by Trump during the fiasco parading as a debate. 
In theory, Joe Biden was supposed to push back on at least some of Trump's lies, but he wasn't up to the task. He got stronger as the night continued, but he was no match for Trump's confident yet completely inaccurate answers. Joe Biden sounded weak and raspy and appeared to stare off into space when Trump blathered on while he created his own reality. The worst moment was when Biden lost his train of thought mid-answer only to blurt out that he beat Medicaid. The entire endeavor dissolved into idiocy when the two elderly men started squabbling about their golf games. It was a disaster for CNN. It was a disaster for Joe Biden. It was a disaster for anyone who thinks Donald J. Trump is a threat to our democracy. After the debate, I was surprised by the immediate reaction on Fox News. Instead of gleefully mocking Joe Biden and celebrating Donald J. Trump, most of the hosts seemed genuinely shocked. Their moods were muted and somber. By the next morning, the network had sent out two hosts to cover diners filled with Fox News fans in two different cities to celebrate Joe Biden's defeat, blame Jill Biden for everything, and praise their glorious leader, Trump. Anyone exclusively watching Fox last week would have missed out on major stories involving rulings by the Supreme Court, an attempted coup in South America, and a ruling that would ban abortion at six weeks in Iowa. Shows I covered last week, Fox and Friends, Thursday, all three hours, that was the night of the debate. Friday, four hours. They did an extra hour. They started at 5 a.m. and I got all four hours. I also did the five, the Ingram Angle, and then I picked up the debate pre-show, which was two hours long. It was two different shows, actually. And the debate post-show, which was kind of three shows. They stuck together. But anyway, it was rough. It was rough. And I'm not here because I'm not a pundit. And I don't feel qualified to make a judgment call on what the DNC or Joe Biden or the Biden campaign should do right now. So I am not going to discuss it. I know people have very strong feelings about it. And I hear you and I empathize. And I it's this is rough. This is rough. I think to brush this off as just a bad night for Joe Biden is just we're not we got to face reality. This was a terrible, terrible, terrible night for Joe Biden. And I will add that since Fox News has been pushing the narrative for two years, at least, that Joe Biden was in cognitive decline, this is just, this is rocket fuel for them. And they they have shown that clip of Joe Biden blanking uh, and blurting out uh, Medicaid all day late. All day today, all day yesterday. They, they showed it all day Friday. This is just, they're just going to show every single screw up. I mean, they were going before they were showing things where he would like sort of maybe kind of miss a step and they'd be like, look, he tripped. And I'm like, no, he didn't trip. He didn't trip. But this is like, this is, there's no, there's no explaining out of this. It's something that they're going to have to deal with. We're going to figure it out. And that's all I want to talk about it. So before the debate, this is a Tuesday on the five Fox news seemed genuinely scared of this situation. And normally they do one segment that's what I would call a Biden bashing segment where they're just like, Joe Biden, we hate Joe Biden, Joe Biden, Joe Biden, Joe Biden. Um, Pretty much every day. That's a regular on every show I watch. There's a segment that there's no other way to describe it other than Biden bashing because it's not actually a story. (laughs) There's no narrative. There's no beginning, middle, end. It's just let's show clips of Biden and rip on Biden. Okay, so uh, Tuesday on the 5, these are the promos. These are just like the first, I shouldn't say promos. These are like the intros to four segments. So in in television news, you'd say A block, B block, C block, D block. That's how they call these. So that's a segment. And then you go A block, go to commercial, B block, go to commercial, C block, go to commercial, D block. And on the five, they tend to get smaller. They tend to get shorter. So the first one might be 10 minutes. Second one might be eight minutes. And they go down to seven, five, three, two. And they have really short segments at the end of the show. Okay. So this is the first four. You're going to notice a trend. I'd never seen this before, which is why I cut it up and turned it into a clip. Joe Biden is as elusive as Bigfoot. Like a Democrat bat signal, the dynamic duo of liberal politics is here to save the blank crusader from losing to the orange menace. Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama both making efforts to sound the alarm. A new piece from New York Mag titled, What Obama is Whispering to Biden. Football game. 
And President Biden condemning a shocking act of anti-Semitic intimidation, but will he back up his words with actions? Bidenomics continues to decimate some of America's most iconic restaurants, with Hooters becoming its latest casualty. So to quickly recap, they criticized Joe Biden for prepping for the debate. They criticized Joe Biden for having people help him prep for the debate. They criticized Joe Biden for condemning anti-Semitism, but not condemning it strongly enough. And then they criticized Joe Biden because Hooters is having financial trouble. Hooters, the uh, restaurant that peaked probably in 1989. <laughs> you know, like Hooters. Like, I remember when it was like a big deal when I was a child. Hooters, where they, they, the, the women, the servers still dress like it's 1983. That's when the, the uh, place was founded. Hooters, like maybe, maybe Hooters, I'm just going to throw it out there. People aren't fond of your tacky misogyny and your exploitation of your servers and the fact that you're dated relic from the 80s. Just saying, maybe just update some things, Hooters. Maybe just take, you know, Hooters with the, eh, eh, call me crazy. It's, it's 2024 now. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know, Hooters. Anyway, but when in doubt, blame Biden. So that's where they were at. So I just thought when I sat there watching this, I go, they just literally started every single segment is Biden bashing every single one, technically. So there's sort of a story, but it was just like excuses to talk about Joe Biden. Basically, all four of those segments were just like, we're going to talk about this. But Joe Biden, Joe Biden, that Biden, that's basically what this turned into. So that was Tuesday. And then. There's really no way to jump around it. I could sh share other stories, but it doesn't make any sense because once the debate happened, that everything got dominated by this debate. <sighs> now, I haven't shared this clip on Twitter because this is it won't make anybody happy, but I wanted to play this for the podcast to show this audience how Fox reacted. And it was surprising to me because I was honestly expecting a totally different reaction. And I was completely crestfallen after the debate. I was, I lost it. My siblings were texting me in shock. Um, I was in shock. I, I was worried it was going to be bad. I had no idea it was going to be this bad. And um, because I can't help but think independent voter. I can't help but undecided voter because that's sort of what is going to make or break this election. Um, the diehards, the people who hate Trump, we're going to vote no matter what. The people who want to get out there and stop Trump, we are going to vote no matter what. Like I said in another podcast, you could take a Dixie cup, fill it with stickers for the DNC of a donkey, and I would vote for that. I'd go, let's do it, Dixie cup full of donkeys. We're doing this. We're doing this. Let's go. But we're not, you know, we got to remember, we're in a bubble a little bit. There are a lot of people out there. I, I, it baffles, it boggles my brain that people would be undecided, given these two men. But there are people out there that are like, you know, I don't know. We've got inflation and this other guy's, you know, saying a lot of great stuff, even though everything out of his mouth is a lie. They don't know that. So this is um, some clips. And I purposely picked clips where people on Fox were actually trying to not just bash Biden. They weren't just praising Trump. These are actually somewhat thoughtful responses, believe it or not. Now, not all of these voices are Fox hosts, which is part of why you're going to hear a more reasoned response here. So we're going to start with Dana Perino. And again, this is immediately after the debate. I saw Joe Biden at the State of the Union. I know we all were there. I didn't like the speech. I thought he yelled a lot, but he was like fine. So we all thought, OK, so maybe he'll, he'll do fine. That was terrible within the first 10 seconds. 80 minutes into the debate is when they asked a question about age. It didn't matter by then what the answer was because everyone had already watched it for 80 minutes. When I watched PBS, they had like a pre-show before the debate where they had a panel talk about the debate and then they had a post-debate show. And the thing that kind of broke my heart a little bit, I'll say this, is in the pre-show, uh, they said repeatedly, Joe Biden has one job and that's not to look old and feeble. And it you know, when the debate was done, PBS was like, OK, yeah, he did not accomplish that. And they were, you know, they're PBS. They're not going to get emotional. They're not going to uh, they just were very blunt. 
Uh, so this is Laura Trump we're going to hear from, and what she says isn't so horrible. I was actually surprised. Almost didn't need to watch it, Sean, with the sound on to see the difference between these two men. It was weakness versus strength. We need strength right now in this country. We need to get this country back. The American people are desperate for it, and it's Donald Trump who will deliver it. So again, when you're talking about like an independent voter, a swing voter, sadly, I hate to admit this, but she's correct because someone's going to see that, someone who's not that plugged into politics, someone who doesn't know that much about either one of these men, which is shocking, but there are still people out there. And they just think, you know, prices have gone up and I don't like that and interest rates are higher and maybe I can't buy a house or whatever. They're just thinking of really basic stuff. They don't pay attention to the Ukraine war. They don't pay attention to, uh, this is like a lot of Americans. I hate to, I'm, you know, this is true. They're not really paying attention to anything international. They, they just say, oh, there's this guy up there. They don't realize he's lying through his teeth. He's saying a lot of stuff. He's confident. And this other guy's staring off into space. And that's, that's a problem. I'm going to show a montage in a, in a short period. Uh, Robert, well, do we have that montage available? Uh, because it was Joe Biden, when he wasn't even speaking, when it was split screen and he was on camera and that, that, that stare, that he just seemed like he wasn't there. Now, I included that clip because that's exactly what Sean Hannity is going to do. That's exactly what this network is going to do. They already do this with trips. Anytime Biden has fallen, they will show that over and over. Like the time he fell on his bike, which was like a fluke thing, and he seemed fine. He got right back up. They still show that clip. They still show the bike clip. When he sort of trips down the stairs of Air Force One, they show that clip. And they'll just show these clips over. They'll just have them on in the background talking about Joe Biden and this montage when he's clipped, he tripped on the sandbag. There's the, there's the clip. There's the clip. There's the clip. And so, you know, we just have to deal with reality. We have to know our enemy. This is what they're going to do. Now, these next two voices, we're going to hear from people who aren't as partisan because they don't work for Fox directly. Uh, this woman is named Lee Hartley Carter, and she's a pollster. She runs her own company. Um, she might be, I don't know that much about her. doesn't really matter because the context of the clip, it doesn't really matter. What she says here is not that partisan. She's been on Fox. She comes on pretty much every election they have her on. She talks about focus groups and that sort of thing. Well, you know, we just finished a, a focus group here um, tonight with voters. Uh, five of them were undecided voters. Uh, none of them decided that they were going to go for, for Joe Biden after tonight. Four of them decided they were going for Donald Trump. And one just said they were too depressed to, to move forward um, with any of the candidates. I think it was a very, very bad night for Joe Biden. I now, this next clip is a woman named Beverly Halberg. And from what I could tell from her LinkedIn, because it was kind of the way she was described, I was like, I'm not even sure what this woman does. Um, she appears to be a media trainer and coach. So she is like helps people express themselves better in the media. And she's also a writer. Um, and this is what she had to say. Also, not as partisan, not as heated as some of the Fox hosts would say. I think this is disastrous if you're the Democrats. Yeah, and this was all about the undecided voter. This isn't for the people who've already made up their mind who they want to vote for. And so what Donald Trump needed to do, I actually think he accomplished, and that was to not have the low blows, to not have the insults, to actually let Joe Biden speak. Joe mm -hmm. Biden was burying himself with what he said. And so even if people didn't decide to pull the trigger for Donald Trump, if they decided not to vote for Joe Biden, maybe not vote at all or go for a third candidate, that's a win for Donald Trump. This last voice is Elizabeth Pipko, who's from the Republican National Committee, she's the Republican National Committee spokesperson. She also is very subdued here, shockingly subdued. The whole tone was like they had just seen a funeral, which was, it took me back because I was like, I was not expecting this. So I it was a rough night for Joe Biden. It was a rough night for the American people who had to watch their commander in chief barely make it through 90 minutes. And it was a rough night for the Democrat Party who got caught red handed, basically lying about who it is that's been running this country for nearly four years now. Now, I would say that that's she went a little bit too far with that one. Um, and there's been a lot of that talk on Fox since of somehow this was a grand cover up to hide the fact that Joe Biden, you know, was cognitively declined the whole time. Now, I remember the 2020 debates. I think if you're politically active and you're into this stuff, you probably remember the 2020 debates. He didn't, he didn't seem like that at all. 
So I would say that that's a bit of a stretch. I think what I don't know what's going on with Joe Biden. And again, I'm not going to say what I think the DNC should do. Um, I have to have hope that we can defeat Trump. That's all I'm going to say. And I will literally vote again for a Dixie cup full of uh, Democrat stickers. Like (laughs) I will. I'm not kidding. I don't care. I, Trump is just an existential threat to our democracy and our country. It was a bad night. It was a very, very bad night. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what to, like I said, I don't know what to say or do, but I, I don't view this as the Democratic Party was covering this up for four years. Like that, I don't agree with that at all. I just don't. I think if this is a cognitive issue, it's something that gradually happens. It's something that you have good days, you have bad days. And I'm not going to make any assumptions, but I'm just saying that if that's what's going on here, I I think it's more about denial rather than a a grand cover up. Um, So anyway, but moving on. And now this is kind of weirdly funny because it we have some I have some fun clips at the end. I just we have to kind of get through the the sad reality of what we're dealing with now. But I do have some goofy clips at the end of this. Um. But this is just the strangest thing. I don't, I, I, I never thought I'd see this. Fox News host gushing about CNN. It happened. And rules and moderators for this evening. And for the most part, the network and its anchors got good marks. The senior national correspondent Kevin Cork is live in D.C. with more on that side of the story. Kevin, good evening. Evening, Trace. Credit where credit is due. Jake Tapper and Dana Bash moderated a clean, balanced, and focused debate tonight. And while both presidents were surprisingly unfocused at times, you know, repeatedly ignoring very straightforward questions, it was. Credit. So I'm glad at least he said that. Because- because that was so true. I think they asked Donald J. Trump what he would do about child care costs three times, and he just didn't answer the question at all. Just didn't answer it. (laughs) I was like, all right then, climate change. We have very clean air and water, the cleanest air, the cleanest. Shut up, you loser. Okay, if you've heard my uh, fact check podcast, I, 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 yeah. Okay, I'm gonna yell at him. This next clip is from Fox and Friends. It's uh, basically the cast doing the exact same thing. So this is the next morning on Fox and Friends. The, the moderator stayed out of the way. They asked the questions, and you can see the bias in the sense of the question that they asked, but they didn't try to step on the candidates. They didn't try to keep pushing back. They let it happen. And, and genuinely, you would like a little pushback, back, but you, they have to restore the trust of the American people before they're allowed to push back again. Despite the negative things they've said about Donald Trump That's in the right. past, you're right. They did handle it very professionally last night, which is what we all wanted. Steve, two things we have. Uh, t- Lawrence, to your point about CNN, I, I, I like the way they did it too it's just okay here's your question yeah. okay that was not a very long answer mr president you have 87 <laughs> seconds left right. what would you like to say <laughs> I, I like the way they did that but th- then here's the thing the, this particular format allowed each of the candidates to fact check each other yep and when joe biden would fact check donald trump did anybody understand Got what he lost, was talking about? Right. Yeah. You know, it wasn't just a meandering, but it was so soft. And then he'd kind of run out of gas. And then I think he got a little flustered. And we know he's he's got a history as being a stutterer since he was a small boy. Right. But none of it right. worked for him. So the next clip is actually not a response to the debate. So as a quick break here, I'd like to give a shout out to my sponsor. And that sponsor would be the readers of my newsletter and the listeners of this podcast. I am 100% funded from people who support this micro budget media project. There's no billionaire writing me a check. There's no foundation. There's no sponsor. There's no advertisements, as you've heard, except for this one. And um, there's no rich parents. My dad was an auto mechanic. So if you would like to support this humble media project, you can, it's a newsroom of one, by the way. I love it when people say my team cracks me up. I'm like, what, the cats, Odin and Thor? Um, you can go to Decoding Fox News at Substack or at Patreon, and you can become a paid supporter or paid subscriber. Subscriptions start at $5 a month, and all paid subscribers and paid supporters get exclusive content. If you can't do that, the next best thing is to share the podcast, share the newsletter, and I appreciate it 
very much. That always helps. Now, moving on to the next clip, and this is something that I'm going to start working on tomorrow, now that I'm finally past that fact check, is Jesse Waters and Project 2025. Now, this was spooky because I've never seen anyone on Fox News mention this. This is the night of the debate. This was in the lead up to the debate, which was amazingly boring. I watched all two hours. I didn't clip a single thing. I was like, this is profoundly dull. Shocking how dull they've made this. Amazing. I think they were legitimately scared. I think they were. I think they were like, what is Trump going to do? Yada, yada. So here he is. This is Jesse Waters just sort of casually dropping Project 2025. Biden highlighted a 900 page report that he says if this is Trump's plan, if he wins, it's not. They call it Project 2025. They say Trump will terminate the Constitution, ban abortions nationwide and defund the police. That's not his policy at all, but it doesn't matter. Biden will use it as a weapon tonight to tell millions of voters Trump's a dictator. Is Trump ready? Now, Jesse Waters left out that several former Trump administration officials worked on Project 2025, and many of his close advisors are huge champions of this conservative plan to reshape the U.S. government. Now, I found a source that just summed it up in a paragraph. Democracy Docket, which is a liberal-leaning voting rights platform dedicated to tracking election litigation. And this is how Democracy Docket described Project 2025. Project 2025 doesn't just include policy proposals like immigration actions, educational proposals, and economic plans, but rather a portrait of the America the conservatives hope to implement in the next Republican administration, be it Trump or someone else. The document is a thorough blueprint for how exactly to carry out such a vision through recommendations for key White House staff cabinet positions, Congress, federal agencies, commissions, and boards. The plan goes so far as to outline a vetting process for appointing and hiring the right people in every level of government to carry out this vision. And this vision is terrifying. They basically want Christian nationalism. They want uh, extreme authoritarian power in the executive. There's plans for people to basically Um, how to hire people for the government through Project 2025. We know that Trump is lazy and doesn't want to do any work himself. So if somebody just hands him a list of like, look at the people you should hire, you know he's going to do that. And that is what is scary. And Republicans have done this for decades. They're all about writing plans, uh, you know, with the Tea Party and Project for America and all of that nonsense. This is what they do. This is what they're good at, and it's they're kind of too good at this. So, yes, we should be fearing this. It is scary. Moving on, but it just it freaks me out how he just sort of casually, oh, that's no big deal. And we know that that's a technique. They know this is an issue. They know anybody left of center is freaking out about it, and their way of diffusing it is to say, that's no big deal. Who cares? We don't care. It's no big deal. So next up, this is Rachel Campos Duffy in the diners. Um, These are two different people she speaks to, and she's in a diner in Georgia. What was funny about these diners is every time they would pan the diner and they'd show everybody in the diner, it was just a sea of old white people because that's who watches Fox. So here we go. David, do you think that Joe Biden is going to be replaced after last night, or do you think that he's going to stay in? I think he's going to be replaced, but I really hate to see that because... They might put somebody in there that Trump can't beat. All right. Really, some, some, some people, particularly women, and they were saying that they're just more scared than ever about the country just seeing uh, Joe Biden's condition on stage last night. Yeah, um, there's no confidence there at all. I'll be surprised if he makes it to the election. I hope he does because I think we have a really great chance because it's like weekend at Bernie's over and over again. So- So it may be surprising, but the reason why I included that clip is there's a little bit of hope there and that these two people, both Trump supporters, one was a a man probably in his early 60s. The other woman was probably in her 40s, based on what I could see. They're both white, both, you know, in Georgia. And in both of their statements, there's a little bit of light that they don't think that Trump could necessarily win. They're not that they're not that diehard that they think, oh, he's a shoe in. We've got this. 
Neither one of them talked about conspiracy theories. Neither one of them mentioned the 2020 big lie. They both said, well, we're hopeful that, you know, Biden stays in the race because it'll be easier for Trump to beat him. They didn't say, we've got this. It's, you know, because a lot of times they interview people that that's all they say is, you know, I, Trump, I love Trump. Trump's my savior. I love Trump. And I can say that voice. I'm from Missouri. Don't even, you know, like the, I'm a semi person and he's just, I, I, I just, I just, I pray to God every night. I pray to him, you know, Trump needs to rule this country again. You know, every other time they go to a diner, that's who they talk to. But that's not who they talk to in that clip. So there's a little bit of hope, a little bit of glimmer. Again, I don't know what the DNC is going to do, but I'm just saying that that's a good sign that we saw that there. I also want to add as a ray of hope that Trump is a weak candidate. And I say this because the man cannot control himself. Even during the, the debate, as poorly as it went for Biden, he's rambling on about golf. He's saying absolutely outrageous things than any other situation with a, a, moderator, a, a moderator who could actually talk back to him would say, wait a second, there's no abortions, not legal after birth in any state. What are you talking about? Um, he was saying outrageous claims that made no sense. Um, he, one of the dumbest ones was when he was like, oh, Putin took land from Bush and Putin took land from Obama. And I was like, what are you talking about? He said we had H2O during, he literally described his environment as like, well, we had H2O. We had great H2O. Other people caught that. He was mugging like a clown. Like he's a weak candidate. He has to lie about his crowd size everywhere he goes. We've seen this pattern. He is not getting the same excitement he got the, the last election. People are fed up with him. When they do polls, they say they don't want these two candidates anymore. And he's one of the candidates. You can't just apply that to Biden. People are fed up with the nonstop chaos and the nonstop drama from that lunatic. And I, I again, I don't know what the DNC is going to do, but I think there is a wedge there. We do not have a strong candidate to run against. We have a weak candidate. He's got his cult following, but they're not big enough. They're not big enough. So anyway, moving on. This one is kind of a goofy clip because Rachel Campos Duffy, who is nonstop comedy to me, um, constantly, she's been bringing this up for two years. I have clip after clip after clip of her talking about how Michelle Obama is going to run for president. And Michelle Obama had to issue a statement in March saying, I'm never going to run for president or I'm not going to run for president now. Michelle Obama has said repeatedly, I'm not going to run for any public office, but Rachel Campos Duffy won't let the dream die. So I'm going to start with Rachel Campos Duffy and then uh, Dana Perino will weigh in. Now she's not, Dana Perino is not responding in time to Rachel Campos Duffy. These are two separate clips, but it's like, we have one person who's totally off a rocker and one person who's a little bit more grounded to this earth. So here we go. To step aside and let somebody else come in, whether it's Newsom or Michelle Obama or Governor Whitmer, Whitmer or, or whoever, um, I think probably the Newsom uh, Michelle Obama ticket makes a lot more sense if I was a Democrat. Michelle Obama. She really doesn't like politics. Yeah, she doesn't like partisan politics, which is why I can't stress enough that she is not going to be the Democratic nominee. I agree. Yeah. Now, I agree. I do imagine yeah. that there are a lot of people that worked in the Obama world who want the Democrats to continue to win. They really don't like Donald Trump. Yes, and so they're trying to be as good as they can. But I think Michelle Obama's like, I don't like politics. I don't want to be around this. I'm enjoying my life. I'm mm -hmm. not going to get involved. I am. And I would agree uh, with Dana Perino on that one. There's no indication that Michelle Obama is going to run for president. They just like make stuff up and like run with it to try to like get their base all worried. Like, oh, no, not Michelle Obama. That means we'd have Obamas again in the White House. We can't have that. No. They're like going to freak out. So they just make stuff up. It's like the Hillary Clinton thing. Like Hillary Clinton was at the Tony Awards in her beautiful gown. I don't I, a caftan. I called it a moo moo. And somebody's like, well, they're also called caftans. And I was like, uh, touche. The beautiful caftan that uh, Hillary Clinton was wearing at the Tony Awards. It was delightful. And she's smiling and she's talking about, like, the Tony Awards. And people were like, she's running for president again. Like, <laughs> there were two clips on Fox that week where they claimed that that was a sign that she was throwing her hat in the ring. And I'm like, no, she's not. 
Hillary Clinton is not going to run for president. So this next clip is by one of my favorite Fox News hosts because everything she says is off the wall bonkers. She's petite. She got her start on reality television. She says crazy things all the time. As I like to say, she's never met a conspiracy theory she didn't immediately believe and then enthusiastically promote. Rachel Campos Duffy, here she is in the diners making a statement that just made me go, just stop it. Stop it. You're out of your mind. Rachel Campos Duffy. And then finally, the Ukraine war is a women's issue. People are concerned that their sons and their daughters even perhaps um, will be drafted into a war that they don't know, understand, and they don't stand for, and they don't want their sons and daughters dying for. She's made comments like that before. This is the first time she brought up daughters dying for a war. But she's, she's literally, I can't make that up. She's literally said, like, your sons and daughters are going to die in Ukraine. And I'm like, lady, hi, we're not at war with Russia. There are no combat troops in Ukraine that are American. We have a handful of troops in the embassy, the U.S. embassy, that are there for training purposes to help the Ukraine military. But we are not in combat positions. We are not at war with Russia. Number two, women do not have to sign up for selective service that would make them eligible for a military draft. There's no political movement to force young women to become part of the selective service program. Currently, a federal law requires that nearly all U.S. male citizens and male immigrants 18 through 25 register with Selective Service. Finally, the U.S. Uh, has not had the draft since 1973. And I'm going to point something out that in that time, that was near the end of the Vietnam War, they finally stopped the draft. It was very unpopular. Um, the United States has had a slew of a lot of military conflicts. If you don't want to call them wars because technically you say, well, that's not a war, we've still had a lot of military conflicts. And guess what, Rachel Campos Duffy? We did not have the draft. There's over a million active duty service members. A mil over a million. And yes, our recruitment goals are, are down, but that's been a trend for years. It went... That trend existed through Trump's presidency, by the way, the recruitment numbers not being high enough. Um, that has been an issue, but we still have over a million active duty service members. We have like 800, 700 bases. It's crazed in every single continent all over the world. I don't think we need the draft for a war that doesn't happen yet. And we're not drafting women. Just stop it. Just stop it. There was a bill that they were talking about. Um, I think that was, I don't know if that made it to the podcast, but I did clip it for Twitter. Somebody put in a bill a couple weeks ago, they were talking about on Fox and Friends, about, you know, adding women to selective service and uh, potentially the draft, if we ever had one again. And Steve Ducey just immediately shot it down and goes, that's never going to pass. <laughs> this bill's never going to pass because no one's going to vote for that. And he, it's, he's right. Um, it could happen someday that they add women to the selective service. It's common in other countries, but I, I don't see a big push for that happening in the United States. And even if it did happen, it would take a long time for that to, to actually become a thing. So if you have an 18 year old daughter and you're worried about her being drafted to Ukraine, stop listening to Rachel Campos Duffy. Okay. Huh. <sighs> Whew. Instead of a uh, judge Shanine, I'm going to do, I'm going to do a Rachel Campos Duffy. That's. Does she talk like that? She sort of talks like that. She definitely has what you'd call vocal nodes. And that she's probably screamed a lot at her nine children. Because that's a lot of children. So her voice always kind of sounds raspy. And she's always really excited. And she's just like, communist, communist, communist. Communist cultural Marxism. Communist. The communists are coming. And they're going to draft your children. I'm Rachel Campos Duffy. <laughs> I went to the Bronx and they, they criticized me. How dare they? I didn't just talk to... Everybody just loved Trump. Everybody in the Bronx just loved Trump. I'm not making that up. How dare you? I'm Rachel Campos Duffy. <laughs> okay, that's my Rachel Campos Duffy. Okay, so now moving on to stories Fox News ignored. Now, this is a weird one because Fox was so dedicated to just bashing Biden and talking about the debate. Even before the debate happened. That's really all they were doing. 
They didn't cover anything last week. It was just so completely slanted. So the list from the PBS stories that Fox News didn't cover was so epically long, I just cut it in half. I'm like, there's no way I can do this. There's no possible way I could read all of these stories and fit this in with everything else I want to fit in. It's not going to fit. This is too much. So I just made, uh, sometimes I cut a few. This time I'm like, we're going to just go, we're going to have to just hack, hack, hack. So I tried to focus on the, the stories I thought were the most important. So again, these are stories. I watched 23 hours of Fox News, five hours of the PBS News Hour, and this is a slew of stories the PBS um, included that Fox did not. And again, I just try to go with the most important stories, and I had to hack this list to death because there's no way it would have fit. So here we go. So we're going to start with updates to the Israel-Hamas war. Now, this first one, I just I put it at the top for a reason. This may not seem like a big deal if you if you don't know a lot about Israel. This is huge, huge. The Israeli Supreme Court ruled that ultra orthodox yeshiva students are no longer exempt from military conscription and are no longer eligible for substantial government benefits. This could greatly weaken Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's ruling coalition. So no matter how you feel about him or Israel, that is actually a big deal. The UN said they will suspend humanitarian aid throughout Gaza until safety conditions for aid workers improve. A floating temporary pier built by the U.S. military to help get more humanitarian aid into Gaza was removed due to rough seas. It may not return until aid flow resumes. Updates to the Ukraine war. The International Criminal Court in the Netherlands issued arrest warrants for Russian officials who have targeted power plants in Ukraine. This is the third time the court has accused senior Russia officials of war crimes. The EU signed a long-term security pact with Ukraine during a two-day summit in Brussels. The agreement comes as the EU is delivering the first military equipment to Ukraine, financed by the profits from frozen Russian assets. So basically what they're doing is they have the assets, and as it accrues interest, they're using the interest to pay for the um, military aid for Ukraine. That's legal. They, had to, they couldn't just take the money because then Russia would do the same thing to them. That's why they're just doing the interest. So here we go. Climate disasters. PBS produced a segment about the depletion of the Olagatha Aquifer, a major source of water for farmers in the Great Plains. The underground water source has been decimated by climate change and overuse. Now we have a special section this week, and this part I definitely wanted to include. Recent Supreme Court rulings and new cases. The court agreed to hear the first case regarding the use of gender-affirming care for transgender youth. The court decided with the Biden administration 6-3 to three in a case involving government communication with social media companies. The court blocked an EPA good neighbors law that would protect states downwind of states that produce air pollution through smokestack emissions from power plants and other industrial sources. The court put the rule on hold while legal challenges continue. Again, all of these court cases are from last week, which is why I'm not going to mention immunity. This is all last week. The court rejected a bankruptcy case that involved the Sackler family of Purdue Pharma and billions in settlements regarding the opioid crisis. The settlement would have protected the family from further lawsuits and paid $6 billion to families and states. Again, that was rejected. So now they're in limbo. The court upheld a law that makes homeless encampments in public parks in a South Oregon city illegal. So the court basically said you can't camp in a public park. That's illegal. The court overturned a 40-year precedent when it reversed what's known as the Chevron deference. Critics say the ruling will greatly weaken federal regulatory agencies, including the Environmental Protection Agency. That one is huge, huge. Fox has not mentioned it at all. There was one case last week SCOTUS that Fox did mention, and that involves the January 6th. That's why it's not on the list. Just giving you that heads up. They did mention that. That's the only one they did. PBS produced a segment about Trump's vows to end funding for schools with vaccine mandates. The vast majority of schools in the United States have mandates for childhood diseases for decades. Prior to vaccine mandates, measles alone would cause 48,000 hospitalizations and 500 deaths a year. Just want to briefly explain that again, because I've watched Trump talk about this so many times in his rallies. 
He just says, I'm against vaccine mandates. He doesn't say COVID-19 vaccine mandates. And that's a real problem. Because if you look this up, and I have looked this up, pretty much every single state mandates like their basic childhood vaccinations. He doesn't preface that with, he doesn't specify, I just want to, you know, say that you can't force people to get the COVID-19 vaccine. He's saying vaccines. And now that would be a huge problem, huge problem. So moving on, violent protests broke out in Kenya over a proposed new tax. During the riots, five people were killed. The president conceded that he would not sign the bill that was meant to help pay off debt. Experts warn that 755,000 people are at risk of famine in war-torn Sudan as the fighting continues between rival militias. The report said that 8.5 million people are facing extreme food shortages after 14 months of conflict in Sudan. Retail software provider CDK Global said it would take days to resolve a cyber attack on 15,000 car dealerships across North America. The U.S. Surgeon General issued a new advisory calling gun violence a public health crisis. The Oklahoma Supreme Court ruled that the state's first religious charter school violated its constitution. Also in Oklahoma, the school superintendent issued a new directive that would mandate the teaching of the Christian Bible and the Ten Commandments in all public schools. More than a dozen high-ranking military officers and intelligence officials were arrested in Bolivia for their role in an attempted coup to replace the president. PBS produced a segment as part of their America at a Crossroads series that explored the decline in Americans participating in religion. More than one-fourth of Americans claim no religious affiliation. The Biden administration issued pardons for U.S. military service personnel who were kicked out of the service because they were LGBTQ. The pardon will affect about 2,000 people who will still have to apply for a certificate to receive withheld benefits. A new drug taken only twice a year could prevent HIV infection. It could have far-reaching impacts, especially in lower-income countries that are facing rising new infection rates. A new study by the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health showed a rise in infant mortality in Texas after extreme restrictions on abortion were put in place. The research found a significant increase in infant deaths, much higher than rest of the country. The Iowa Supreme Court overturned a lower court's decision to block a ban on abortion at six weeks. The ruling will ban all abortion after six weeks, allowing for exceptions for rape, incest, and when the medical procedure is necessary to save the life of the mother. The Biden administration extended temporary protected status to 300,000 Haitians already living in the U.S. due to the crisis in Haiti. Haitians can stay in the United States for 6 to 18 months with the possibility of an extension. The former Uvalde School District Police Chief, Adrian Gonzalez, was charged with 10 counts of abandoning and endangering Robb Elementary survivors. The indictment alleges that despite having time to respond to the shooting, Gonzalez failed to act to impede the gunman and failed to follow active shooter training by not advancing toward the gunfire. Two astronauts who traveled on a Boeing spacecraft will have to stay in the International Space Station for several more weeks as engineers troubleshoot problems with Boeing's new space capsule. So again, that was half of them. I cut out half the stories because I'm like, there's no way I can do this. There's a lot. But I thought those were the most important ones, especially the ones about abortion, especially about the Supreme Court. There's a lot of stuff that a Fox viewer would have missed out on. So here we go on to buy the numbers. Every week I compare the top five topics on Fox News and I compare that to the top five topics on the PBS NewsHour. We're going to start with Fox. Here we go. Can't make this up. Biden bashing. 46%. You didn't, they didn't, they didn't, it's almost half the airtime. Just ripping on Biden. 13% presidential debate. 12% promotion of Trump. So Trump 2024, border crisis, 8%, and 2% was the representative Jamal Bowman primary. PBS NewsHour, top five topics for the week ending June 30th, 2024. 17% presidential debate, 12%, all of those SCOTUS rulings, some of them they just mentioned, some of them they went into depth with. 
Uh, thir- 5% artist profile. That's a standard on PBS. 5% more Americans are non-religious. I actually loved that segment. Please check it out on YouTube if you'd like. And then 5% Julian Assange plea deal. Fox News also reported on that, which is why that was not on the list. So um, I just want to briefly say uh, the PBS segment, which is called America at a Crossroads, you can find this on YouTube for basically America at a Crossroads. Crossroads, uh, Judy Woodruff produces this, and she spoke to Americans about like why they're leaving churches and why people aren't religious as much anymore. And the sort of the subtext, there's more to this. It was just one episode. And I was riveted. I loved it. But the subtext was too many churches are conflating or working with uh, political movements. And that soured a lot of how people view religion. And I found that fascinating because I've said before, religion's toxic to to government and government's toxic to religion. And people just basically said, like, they're, it just, I don't want to go on too much of a tangent, but I did find this segment just fascinating. Um, they talked to one couple who were like a middle-aged couple and they went to this one church and it was close to their home. It was their denomination. And they said they got fed up with the fact that they had this program that was helping uh, migrants, uh, you know, undocumented immigrants help feed them, house them, and that people in their church hated it because politically they didn't agree with it. And they said, I thought we were supposed to help people. The couple did. And they ended up changing churches and traveling to this church. It was 45 minutes away. They had to drive to it uh, there and back. And it was like a totally different energy at this new church. And they were like, this new church is diverse. It has gay people, it has people of every, uh, you know, ethnicity and they're far more open. And guess what? They're helping people. And we like that church. And I was like, oh, I was like having a moment. It was a beautiful segment. I'm not religious at all, but I like it when religion has a positive thing over somebody's life. And it doesn't always. Kind of a mixed bag. But anyway, I think we all know that. (laughs) Regardless of faith, there's people who are wonderful and there's people that you're like, oh, really? Really? Like Rachel Campos stuff? He claims she's Christian was making fun of uh, Paul Pelosi getting hit in the head with a hammer. She laughed about that on air. And that was appalling. I think it got like 3 million views on, uh, on on Twitter. Anyway, and she's like, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Oh, Paul Pelosi, somebody tried to kill him. That's <laughs> what she did. I'm like, okay, okay, that's an interesting view of Christianity there, lady. So we're going to move on to the words used on Fox for the week ending June 30th, 2024, starting with Biden. Staggering at 1,294 mentions. Trump, 1,065 mentions. Debate, 733 mentions, border, 250, crime, 99, migrant, 89, economy, 81, Israel, 46, Hillary, 42, replace, as in replace Joe Biden, 31, China, 19, Iran, 15, AOC for Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, 18, Jill Biden, that is Jill Biden, it's kind of hard to sometimes tell Joe or Jill, so Jill Biden, Our first lady, 18, Hunter Biden, 14, and Michelle Obama, 14. Because they kept saying, well, maybe she'll run for president. Maybe she'll, hey. So that's it. That's the end of the podcast. If you'd like to check out more of my work at Decoding Fox News, you can go to my Twitter, uh, also known as X, Threads, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. I should have some new stuff coming for YouTube that will only go on YouTube because it won't fit on the other platforms. It's going to be too long. So check that out. My YouTube channel is Juliet Jeske, which is my name, J-U-L-I-E-T, J-E-S-K-E, Prussian for Hedgehog, no no joke. Um, also, uh, you can go to my Facebook fan page. I think I got them all. I'm really tired. If you'd like to become a paid subscriber to Decoding Fox News, you can go to my Substack channel at Decoding Fox News, my Patreon at Decoding Fox News, and all paid subscribers, paid supporters get exclusive content that's going to be starting with a huge thing I'm doing on the 2025 project, which will eventually be available to everybody. They're just getting a first peek at it. So the podcast mascots odin and thor send their love you can also find a version of this and all of my podcasts on the resolute square youtube channel thank you so much for listening i'll see you at the next podcast have a happy fourth of july everybody if it's not your holiday just have a happy day off if you have to work at least get some ice cream or something have some chocolate chip in honor of joe biden thank you so much for listening Thank you. 
Resolute Square.